Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Issues and Answers. I am Richard Doxery. Every year, the international community observes what they refer to as Disaster Reduction Day. Generally, we refer to it as Disaster Risk Reduction. And to talk about how, particularly in light of climate change, I dare say, and to talk about what our country, St. Lucia, is doing, has been doing, in terms of reducing the country's, and by extension, the citizens' risk to disasters, I have with me three of our key technocrats within government. And to my immediate right, we have Naomi Sherry. She is from the Department of Infrastructure. In the center, we have Mr. Andrew George. He is from the National Emer Emergency Management Organization, NEMO. And Mr. Peter Norville from WASCO. So welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of disaster risk reduction, which is a big thing, I mean, globally, and we have witnessed in recent times what has happened with Dominica, and even more recently what has happened with Michael in Florida, the Florida Panhandle. How seriously is the Department of Infrastructure looking at this? How does it filter that, factor it into its programming? Well, to reduce um, disaster risk, um, the department have now focused or shift the, the aim in um, building back better um, improving the road infrastructure as to be more climate resilient. And um, we actually have initiatives, national initiatives within our budget to improve our staff in training and designing for um, disaster risk reduction. It's interesting you, talk, you spoke about improving the capacity of the staff because usually when we speak disaster risk reduction, we look at the major projects, the bridges and maybe the hospitals and so on. But we don't normally realize that this, the softer projects, like even building capacity, is critical to disaster risk reduction. Um, Mr. George Nemo, well known throughout the country, fundamentally, how is it that you focus? What is your central focusing point in as far as reducing the risk of disasters in the country is concerned? Well, for us at the national level, uh, as you know, our responsibility is coordinating what happens in the country and in, in so far as preparing St. Lucia for a disaster event. Uh, as you rightly said, the, the focus has shifted from being a response agency into a more preparation and giving the countries and the communities a, a chance to prepare themselves for disasters. At the infrastructure level, they do the structural interventions to enable the country to get ready. For us, we do the non-structural, uh, which is we work with the communities to put on drills, to put on training, to build capacity within the communities to uh, enable them to have that better ability to deal with the disaster event. And also, we institute some of the early warning systems that are there to help also to help the communities get more, more prepared. And as you mentioned, the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is celebrated on the 13th of October, this year the theme was looking at the economies of disaster loss. And that is something now we have to focus on. How much are, is the country losing every time there's a disaster impact? Uh, we, when we do the, the, the damage assessment, you get a sense of how much the country has been damaged. But sometimes the loss which is the loss of productivity, the loss of the agriculture sector, those take time to recover. So whilst the fields are down, the loss of livelihoods, all of that is a cost to the country. And every year, inter worldwide, millions of billions of dollars are lost in disaster events. And once you start to focus on what is causing all those losses, you can now have a better chance of preparing so that you minimize those losses and to restore livelihoods, which is critical. Very, very important point that you made because, for example, and the, the data indicates that in 2016, internationally, there was about $306 billion worth of loss, which was twice, in 2017, by the way, which was twice what it was in 2016, which seems to indicate that going forward, the losses are going to be even more humongous. 
But water, um, and Peter, is critical. Whether well, it's pre-disaster, but more particularly post-disaster. So WASCO has a very significant role to play when it comes to preparing and even responding post-disasters. What is your focus now, considering that we live in an era of climate change? Uh, thanks, Lucius. The, th the thing about it, as you just mentioned, is that we, we are very conscious now of the climate change issues and the climate, climate impacts. And WASCO is, is very recently, actually, has been working um, through a CDB-funded initiative on um, b building its own capacity in terms of addressing climate-related issues. We've just concluding the, an assignment called the Climate Risk Vulnerability Assessment and preparing an adaptation plan of action um, that looks um, at all aspects of WASCO's operations, how ready we are in terms of addressing the trends in climate change and what steps we need to take to be able to respond and to be in a, even in a better position um, moving forward. And that exercise is about to conclude and we are therefore going to have a roadmap, as it were, um, to guide us and in terms of what we need to do, the investments we need to make, and as was mentioned earlier, in terms of some of the other softer aspects of um, vulnerability assessment and risk reduction in terms of capacity building, both for the staff and also in terms of contributing to national efforts in terms of our population as a whole and in terms of general awareness. So we are taking steps and we are certainly cognizant of the issues and we are putting ourselves in a position to respond. Yeah, great. It seems generally speaking that um, as a country we are quite aware as to what's going on and what needs to be done and certainly from what you have said so far it means that we are indeed taking steps um, incremental as they are but certainly in terms of building and reducing our risk to disasters. Namely, you spoke, we, we spoke about the, the soft projects and the hard projects, the buildings, the construction, but also the capacity building for, the, for staff. What has been happening within your ministry in terms, as it regards building the capacity of staff to, be, to better be able to deal with issues as it pertains to reducing the country's risk to disasters? Well, under the DVR project, which is the World Bank funded project, um, there is a component there for capacity building of the department. Um, presently, there is a German consultant who is actually doing assessment of the department as to the inadequacies, what is missing, what training we, we require, what equipment and tools we may require to design a more resilient infrastructure. So presently, that is ongoing. And after the, uh, the assessment and the report, um, DVRP, there is also funding to purchase and procure these equipment and tools and training as well needed for the department. Very great. What has been happening within your own institution, NEMO, in terms of strengthening the institutional capacity of the individual staff and, by extension, the organization as a whole? Yeah, we have uh, made some uh, strides in, in, in that aspect. Uh, still baby steps, but I mean, it's imp important steps to ensuring that the department has that capacity. We have now, for sh particularly, we have 18 district disaster committees around the country where, where they are at the ground level and they, their job is to ensure that the communities, uh, because we want to start at one household, one community, one country, to try to get everybody to be as prepared as possible. And those district disaster committees are at the local level, uh, getting persons within the communities as prepared as possible. Uh, we have set up some early warning systems in certain communities. Uh, we also have what we call broadcast interrupt, uh, where we can interrupt some of the broadcasts, some of the radio stations uh, to give out information on an impending uh, event so that persons can get as much time as possible to ev evacuate if they need. We also now, uh, in the process, in fact, this week we're going to be reviewing our legislation to look at what type of laws we have so as to ensure that some of the laws we have, uh, the last time our laws were reviewed was uh, 2006. So we're now trying to see how to include some of the events, the like climate change issues, into those, into those. Because with climate change, it's expected that there'll be more, not more storms, but more, more deadly storms. So you will have to prepare for those things. 
and we need legislation to give us some aspect of, of ability to do what we need to do. Uh, we have to um, ha rationalize issues to be all clear, how the all clear is given, uh, the national shutdown, we need to know how we're shutting the country down, what time to shut the country, how to reopen the country after the event. Uh, all of those things have to be enshrined in law. So to give us that capacity to do what we need to do. So we have to have a clear legislative agenda and we are trying out this week to review what we have and of course to make the recommendations to include what is not there. Okay, great. It's a good time to take a break, but don't go fast. Stay with us. We'll be back with you shortly. Climat la terre can change. Exa can affect nous tous. Cyclone can be ni plus mauvais. Good low et la pande low can détruire les animaux et plants. Quand la mer can be ni plus chaud et can tuer pas qui se pressent dans la gravité. La mer chaude can aussi changer manière se pressent car qu'il est d'un côté et aller à l'autre côté. Cette liste can contribue en petit zinc gaz en l'espace. Quand un petit pays nous can essayer faire tout ça nous sans faire pour assurer qui nous baisser à ce quantité gaz nous can servir pour empêcher la terre Et il faut pour baisser à ce quantité de gaz nous avons servi, c'est mitigation. Le climat a changé. Il a changé depuis que nous tout au niveau de la terre, Kabouli, gaz, l'huile et le chèbon. Et ça, quand on est la terre, il a changé plus chaud. Ça, nous ne pouvons faire tout le monde, c'est pour adapter. Nous faisons tout ça, nous avons fait pour préparer et répondre pour ces conséquences négatives à la cause du changement climat. Nous tous, ça fait quelque chose. Par exemple, nous n'y pouvons assurer qui nous protéger tout ça nous a planté. C'est vie fumier qui est naturel. Pratique quand nous pour abattre des manches en temps cyclone et godlo. Construit canal pour de l'eau couille bien quand il faut. Et assurer qui canal là par les ordi. Fait tout ça qui est possible pour vivre en temps changement climat ça. Trouvez plus d'informations à ce plan d'adaptation national gouvernement et des marches ou même ça prend pour protéger corps et tout notre cette les siens. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Mrs. Doxery, and we've been speaking about disaster risk reduction. Every year the international community commemorates this day in October, October the 13th to be precise. But we're looking at what we are doing at home, what we're doing in St. Lucia. And thus far, it's very impressive in terms of the information that has emanated from our guests today. The DBRP, the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project, is about St. Lucia's premier disaster risk reduction project. And it spans a wide gamut of initiatives. So I'm just going to ask you, Naomi, I know there are not so many initiatives that the Department of Infrastructure is implementing, but in terms of oversight, technical oversight, your department has a great foothold in all of this. So speak to us, tell us some of the initiatives that you have oversight for. Well, on the DVRP, the Department of Infrastructure are overseeing numerous projects um, such as hospitals, schools, um, road infrastructure. But just to name a few of them, we have um, completed was the Denry Infant School and also the Denry Access Road, which was leading to the Denry Secondary School, as well as the um, reconstruction of the Colonel's um, culvert. Um, but also to come at uh, the Miku Wellness Center, Sufre Hospital, we have the Denry Polyclinic under there as well. There are a number of um, other initiatives under that um, project. Great. So there you go. In terms of the DVRP, it's, you know, it's, it's in terms of it's how far it tentacles go, there are a number of initiatives in the DVRP, and I'm happy that you mentioned some. Now to you, um, Andrew. And as far as Nemo is concerned, how challenging is it in terms of informing people as to how to best prepare in the event of a disaster, how to prepare for and how to respond for? What are some of the challenges that Nemo encounters? And do you have the capacity as an institution to unfold your mandate? Well, <laughs> interesting. The, what we require uh, for, from our people is some behavioral change, uh, and that is the challenge to get people to understand the need for understanding that disasters can have tremendous toll on life and livelihoods, and to understand, for people to understand what it takes for our organization to enable us to give us that, that, that hole. And as um, Ms. Naomi was talking about, the, the critical infrastructure that is needed, 
uh, we have uh, we use schools as shelters. Uh, we need to f so so you need to have schools that can withstand the new climatic realities. So uh, our police stations, fire fire stations, those are cri hospitals. Those are critical infrastructure that's needed post a disaster event. So you want to make sure that those those critical infrastructure are there. Persons will be needing them after disaster. So we need to make sure that those critical infrastructure are there. The challenge remains having individual persons take responsibility for, for themselves. As we tell persons, your home should be your first shelter. So you have to build in such a way that your home is able to withstand some of those climatic events. We are there as an as a organization to assist, and if, you, if you're not able to uh, have your home, of course a shelter will be open to accommodate you. But that takes effort and that is, that is a challenge in itself. Because once a shelter is open, the government assumes responsibility for everything that goes in there. So we have to have security, you have to have medical, you have to have everything. So we want to make sure that you are able to take care of yourself. So the behavioral change that is required to enable people to take on that initial responsibility is what is our challenge. So where we, we, we go out and we do the training and we do the capacity building, we do the drills. Uh, but I must say, I have been in, this, in the organization for the last 14 years, but I have seen slowly but surely the the changes and the improvement that that is necessary i think people are of course they see what is happening in other countries and persons are taking heed and i think uh this time around we've seen a change in the people are when when you see it the oracle is not given please stay home people heed that so that is that is that is a good thing and that is a a, a positive sign that People are taking responsibility, people are understanding the impact of those, those events and what it can do to their lives. So once we get that continuing and people start taking that responsibility, then all the little pieces that we are putting in place will fall into place and St. Lucia will become as disaster prepared as possible. And we don't want to go have a state where we build back better. In fact, we want to build better before, and this is what we want to do. So instead of waiting for the disaster event to destroy the country, let's build better before. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you put it, because while the tagline, the, slo the slogan for the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project is building back better, I do understand and appreciate the concept of building better, better before. before. Yeah. This, this is very um, fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm also heartened by the fact that you have said that you can see tangible changes in the way people are behaving. And some of the um, simple things that people can do is, in terms of, say, garbage, mm -hmm. ensuring that they don't litter, all right? Or ensuring that they dispose of the garbage responsibly. Some of the other things that they can do is to ensure that gutter rings as mm -hmm. much as possible on top of the, the, the rooftops. And some of the things that they can do as well is to ensure that there are proper drains mm -hmm. to ensure that this water goes out. So there are lots of little things that we can do and based on what you're saying, apparently that we are doing it. Um, Wasco, critical, water is life. Every drop costs, every drop counts when it comes to water. More specifically, in terms of the DVRP, what is happening as it pertains to um, Wasco? Well, for Wasco, the main initiative under the DVRP is the redevelopment of the millet intake. Uh, many people don't know that, but the millet intake is a source of water for the north that complements the John Compton Dam. And um, the millet intake was actually there in use before the John Compton Dam. And it's still a very significant source of water. The good thing about the millet intake too is that it is a gravity feed, meaning that at the height at which it, it, it is, we are able we, we don't rely on pumping, so all of the water from the millet intake literally comes to the treatment plant at Cicero via gravity, so it, which means it reduces our electricity costs. So the more we can get out of the millet intake, the less pumping we do and the less we need to rely on the John Compton Dam. So it's complementary and it's a significant source of water. So um, we had damage to that intake on the Tropical Storm Thomas and we've been so it has compromised the the yield at that intake and so we are now working through the dvrp to design a new intake that will take into consideration all the risks relating to the climate change 
and that will in the end give us uh, a better intake that we are able to rely on to assist in the supply of water for the north. So the DVRP is contributing significantly in that regard. Just quickly, where are we with, with this? At what well, point we at this point, we're doing a feasibility study and detailed design. We're quite advanced. A lot of the preliminary work has been done. And within the next few months, we should be completing that, which would allow us then to go out into the construction phase, which would likely take place next year. You can the construction phase would be take about? We're, we, we're still working on that. Um, we're thinking it may be in the region of a year, maybe 18 months, but um, that is part and parcel of the work we're doing now to determine how much it's going to cost and how we're going to do it and how long it's going to take to construct. Okay, great. Um, I know that we are kind of running out of time now. It has been very fascinating thus far. And uh, just to see, uh, as it pertains to disaster risk reduction and more Specifically, the DVRP or the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. There are projects that has to do with rehabilitation of the George F. L. Charles Airport. The projects that has to do with um, rehabilitation of the Hibernator International Airport. There are also projects that has to do with the establishment of polyclinics mm -hmm. and so on. So it is really, as I said, all embracing. So as we come to the end, I'd just like to tell you quickly, Naomi, in about 10 seconds, in terms of your work at the department, generally, how does it, how do you really see it benefiting the public? Well, tremendously. It's actually improving our climate resilience. Um, we building back better infrastructure that could resist um, um, category five or <laughs> four hurricanes, which are so um, predominant now. So we, we want to make sure we are capable, we have the capacity to be able to resist such um, climate changes. Yeah, and, and you, George? We also say that, of course, um, in the last, um, last 10 years, the last decade, the most of the, the big events have been flood events and so hydrometeorological events. So we have to cater for those. And I mean, there's a lot of uh, flood events, so people have to understand those events cost livelihoods, cost lives, so you have to prepare. Uh, the building codes is another one that will help people to focus on what they build, how they build. We have to take in the economic losses uh, in the agriculture sector, the fishery sector, all those people are impacted by those events. And as climate change takes hold, and as I say, climate change is a reality, it's, it's happening. Uh, we contribute least to it, but we'll be impacted by the most of it. And as somebody said, we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation to do something about it. Well, thank you very much. We've come to the end of our program, and I'd like to say thank you for those of you listening. We've been talking about disaster risk reduction, and we've indicated that the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project is one of the premier disaster risk reduction initiatives in St. Lucia. Thank you for watching. Until the next time, I'm Mr. Doxery. Here's to a great day. <laughs>